Amen. Alex is going to take a seat for a minute, but Alex is going to come up and share with us very shortly. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is great to see you all this morning. Um, so on the 28th of August, 1963, Martin Luther King, who I'm sure you're, most of us are familiar with, he stepped up to a microphone to a packed Washington, and he gave one of the most famous speeches of all time. Martin Luther King had a dream, a dream that one day his children would not be judged by the color of the skin, but by the content of their character. A dream that one day every valley would be exalted, every hill and mountain made low, the rough places made plain, the crooked places made straight, and the glory of the Lord would be revealed so all flesh might see it together. That was what his hope was based upon. But this hope was seen as a threat in the world 60 years ago. And five years later, we know that he ended up being killed. And sadly, in Black History Month 2022, we are still awaiting the complete fulfillment of that dream. Now, some 2,000 years before that, there was a guy called Stephen, And he stood up and shared some of the hope that he had in the good news of Jesus. But as he shared his hope, he too upset those in authority, so much so that he was stoned to death. He was the first Christian to be killed for his faith. But the source of that hope spurred the early church on to share the good news with the world. Now, as it was for the early church back in those days, We sense this is a time for our church to advance, to move forward, to to scatter and to share the good news of Jesus. But the, the thing is, when the church is moving forward, there's a reality that opposition will come. We see that in the life of Stephen, the story we're about to read. And we see that in the life of our own church as well. As we advance, you know, we've just launched a new site in Staines. We're serving more food than ever, than we have ever done to people in need within our community. And as Emilio shared on the video earlier, we're going to be opening up our building to, to, for those that are in need this winter to create a warm space. But in the, in the midst of that, we face opposition because that's not how the devil wants things to go. He doesn't want us to be doing these things. So over this last year, even just as a leadership team, we've experienced bereavement. We've experienced chronic pain, serious illness, family difficulties, mental health struggles. And, and dare I say, even the, the news that Rick and Luli just shared, we, our hearts grieve with them, with all that they're facing right now. All as we've tried to be obedient to what we sense the Lord is asking of us. So this morning, we're going to be continuing our series as we think about what it means to be a biblical church. Now, let me give a a little bit of context, and then we're going to share some verses from the book of Acts in the New Testament. We read earlier, and we've gone through this series, we've, we've seen that many were being added to their number daily. But this included widows who were struggling to put food on the table. You see, there was desperate need, and the church stepped up to fill that need. Does that sound familiar? Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, was asked to lead on this. And so we're going to pick up um, from Acts chapter 7, verse 8. I'm just going to read a few verses, and then we'll jump ahead again. Let me just get this open for us. Sorry, chapter 6, should I say. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandra, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. 
they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Now, this is the same Sanhedrin, the same court that Jesus um, stood up to um, not long before. And moving on to verse 13, they produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked him, are these charges true? To this he replied, brothers and sisters, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he, while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And so I'm going to pause there because Stephen goes on to share with the high priest and all the, same, the, the Sanhedrin how God had demonstrated his presence through the ages from Abraham to Isaac, from Joseph and Moses to King David and his songs, son Solomon, who, built the, who indeed built the temple in Jerusalem. And so it's amazing how he demonstrates how God's presence has been with them all the way through. And then we're going to pick up um, again in verse 48 of uh, chapter 7. Do you take some time to read through this in your, in your own time. Just want to make sure we have some time to pray for each other at the end as well. And it says this, However, the Most High does not live in houses made by men. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. He's going hard, isn't he? You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep and Saul was there giving approval to his death. And we'll just read the first verse of chapter 8. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Amen. So just to add that this is the same Saul who, not very long later, encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. You remember that road to Damascus experience, the great, great light, and, and, and Jesus says to him, who... Uh, you know, he, why are you persecuting me, basically? Why are you persecuting me? And so he goes on and has this incredible transformation. And he becomes known as Paul. And he's the one who shared the good news of Jesus to so many people and planted so many churches as he did that. Now, this passage might suggest that this must have been the rock bottom for the early church. But it turned out to be a turning point for the church. Now, as I said earlier, we're looking at what it means to be a biblical church. And this passage and the life of Stephen help us to understand what this looks like. And we see some of the growth that happens as a result of this just tragic story. So what is a biblical church? Firstly, a biblical church, I believe, knows and lives Scripture. You see, Stephen knew his Bible. Rather than just defend what he is doing he goes on the offensive. We see that, don't we? He takes his listeners on a history of Israel, sharing a testimony of God's faithfulness and of his sovereignty. 
However many times his people fell short, God was constantly working out his plan. He was in control from beginning of time. And in the end, we know that he will make all things new and right. But in between, he uses his people and he wants to demonstrate his goodness and his kindness and his love through his church. Now, many in this world would describe churches as a building, but the real church is the people. It's you and I. So if we want to be a biblical church, it needs to start with you and I, knowing and living out our scriptures. The more we know and understand the word of God, the more we understand who God is and his heart for the world that we live in. That's where it begins. So if we want to engage today, maybe you have a paper Bible, like one of these old-fashioned things, but they're great to have a physical Bible just to turn to. Maybe you often use the app on your phone. That's great. You can read, you can listen to the Bible there. But where to start? Firstly, make sure you're, you have a Bible. And if you don't have one today, you can, you can download an app on your phone very easily. Or if you haven't got one or you haven't got a phone, I'd love to help provide you with a Bible today. Come and talk to me afterwards. Why don't you start by reading a gospel or using an app like the Bible in One Year, such a fantastic resource, or even the Lectio 360 app. That's a great way to be able to pray and engage with the Bible day by day. So I want to encourage you, what step could you take today to live out the Bible? You know, if you only read it, to, maybe it's just the words that come behind up on the screen on a Sunday. Why not try to read the Bible during the week? Maybe you're someone who reads your Bible every few days. Why not start trying to read the Bible every day? And if you're someone who reads the Bible every day, why don't you take more time to study the Bible deeply, to go deep and to understand what is being said in there? So I want to encourage each of us, wherever we find ourselves, to take a step today. But you know, it's one thing knowing Scripture. It's another thing living it out. You see, Jesus summarized scripture into two things. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. Now that might sound very simple at surface level, but what does that look like for you and I? I, th I think for many of us, it starts with how we spend our time and how we spend our money. Do our bank statements, do our diaries demonstrate and show that God or something else comes first? Perhaps it's actually more likely Netflix or shopping or our mortgage or football. What about, how, what does that look like for us if we're really brutally honest with ourselves? And what about loving our neighbors? You see, I, the second thing I want to share with us is that a biblical church serves others. The church is at its best when it gives itself away, when we give ourselves away to the needs of others. And I love how the early church did this. We read earlier in chapter 6 that there were a group of widows struggling to even put food on the table. And it's the church that steps up. They said, we need godly, spirit-filled people to help feed the poor. And in chapter 6, we read that men full of the spirit and wisdom were chosen to take on this responsibility. And it's Stephen who was chosen to lead this group. You see, a biblical church always looks for ways to serve others. When we see a need, we step up. I love that we're able to open up our building this winter as a warm space. I love that we have a job club helping people to find work. I love the fact that we're able to serve so many people with food. I hate the fact that we have to do it, but I love the fact that it's the church that's stepping up into that space. But you know, I also love the fact that we get to be a part of something here each Sunday. One of the best ways that we can serve others is by being part of one of our Sunday teams. Now, there's some cards on your seat that look a little bit like that. Can you just wave those at me if you can see those nearby? Now, firstly, many of you, I know, serve on teams from the car park. If you were serving in the car park this morning, God bless you and thank you. Your reward will be in heaven. But... <laughs> 
Wow, it was, uh, it was pretty chaotic out there this morning with the rain, wasn't it? But thank you so much. Other of us, others of us serve um, refreshments. So those that are going to be serving coffee soon, we, we love you and we're grateful for you. Um, for those that are serving kids and youth, helping our children and young people to understand and know Jesus for themselves, thank you so much. The reality is when we're serving in the car park, we're not just pointing people into car parking spaces. We're welcoming people. You are the very first person that a newcomer might see. You're the very first person that someone who doesn't even know Jesus might see. Isn't that a remarkable thing to be able to do, to be able to serve others in that way? I love what Nelson Mandela said. He said that there can be no greater gift than that of giving one's time and energy to help others without expecting anything in return. I think that's really good. So if you're not part of a team, I want you to grab one of those cards right now. Take one of those, fill out your details on there. You can fill out your name, email address, telephone number. Tell us what team you'd like to try it. And then you can tick a box of what service you'd like to be a part of as well. And and we will then get in touch with you. And, And we invite everyone to try something out. If it doesn't work for you, you can try another team. The way that it works is just one Sunday a month. That's what we ask of people to do. And the other three Sundays, you get people to serve you during that space. So take a moment, fill that card, and then you can drop it into the connect area at the end of the service. Now, I believe, you know, passionately that we all have a role to play. We have all been given gifts, and we are all called to serve. And God longs for each of us to use them. So a biblical church, it serves others, but as we've also talked about, also already talked about, it also suffers. You know, we are in, we sense we're in this season of advance with all those things that we're able to do. But the reality of life and indeed the gospel is that there are times when we all suffer. I'm going to invite Alex to come up and share for a little bit now. Let's welcome Alex as he comes up and I'll be back in a moment. Good morning. Ash started the service in the morning saying that he's not used to speak, he's used to sing. I can say that I'm not used to speak, I'm used to listen. That's why my heart is beating so fast now. But uh, my hope is that beyond my words, you will hear God's voice today. Looking at Stephen, I'm very impressed by his calmness and tranquility in the situation he is in. Being unjustly accused, dragged out of the city, threatened by death, (coughs) he kneels and prays for his persecutors. Turning his eyes to the sky, suddenly he sees something that others around him did not. He saw another reality, another dimension of things. The heavens opened, the glory of God was there, And Jesus was standing on the right hand of God. How can we have a similar attitude when things get complicated in our lives? Of course, we are all worried when we hear about the cost of living, inflation, war, other political issues these days. It is hard for us when we go through periods of sickness and suffering. And it is so hard when we lose someone we love. It can sometimes happen that we are hurt because we don't have the things that others have. We look at their houses and cars, at their vacations and clothes, maybe their talents, and we just getting depressed, and we are not seeing anything good for us in the future. The calmness and peacefulness that we see in Stephen Stephen came from the way he perceived God. He was a righteous man and full of the Holy Spirit. For him, God and the Bible, heavens and eternal life were clear convictions, not just Sunday religious things. The way you perceive God will radically influence the way you act, the way you see things around you. Stop being intimidated by the threats that come at you every day. God is with you. 
this should impress you the most. Yes, the dangers are there, present in front of you. But God is also there, present with you. This is the true reality. This is what you have to see and believe. You cannot see this reality by watching TV or social media or talking to people who do not know God. The complete reality is seen when you bend down on your knees and lift your eyes to the sky and look to the one who can do everything. That is why it is so important to spend time with God and listen to what he has to say about your situation you are in, about your future. Seen from the sky, things always look different on earth. God's eyes see things differently than people do. When Joseph was an insignificant slave with no future in the Egyptian slave market, God saw in him a future prince of Egypt. Everyone saw in David just a shepherd, but God saw a future king. In Esther, you could only see a poor orphan girl without a mother or a father, but God saw in her the empress who will save an entire nation. Abraham saw himself as a man without children and descendants, but God saw in him as a father of many nations. That's how the things are seen from God's heaven. Likewise, you have value in the eyes of God. He sees you differently than people see you. He loves you and cares about you and your future. He has great plans for you and great things to do in your life. You are not a soul lost in London and without a future. Even if that's how you feel sometimes or how others see you, that's not the reality. God sees you, God sees in you what others cannot see, and even you cannot see. People do not have the last word for your life, but God. Amen. Ask God today to open your eyes so that you can see his glory and his greatness and how he holds the whole universe in his hands. To see who your father is, who is the one who supports you, who is the one who fights for you, and if he stands for you, who can stand against you? Amen. I will always preach about the living God who is involved in our lives down to the smallest detail. A God who is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. When I was alone and without hope, when all my plans and my dreams had been ruined, when those around me saw no future for me, God was present there by my side. All I could do in those moments was talk to God through prayer as you talk to your best friend. I shared all my fears and all my pain with him every night, with many tears sometimes. Reading the Bible, I was inspired with the extraordinary works that God has done for those who trust in him. In this way, like Stephen, I began to see another reality, and my heart was filled with confidence, peace, and joy. That's how I always came out victorious together with God. I want to end by telling you this. Don't be afraid about what you're seeing around you. This is not the whole reality. Whatever problem you have, talk to Jesus about it. Whenever you are afraid, talk to Jesus and your state will change. Whenever you feel alone and rejected, go to Jesus. He loves you more than you can imagine. Read the Bible. Talk to him in prayer and do it often. Always look up because help comes from there. Amen. Amen. Alex, thank you so much. That was great. So, you know, suffering is a reality of the gospel. Uh, the pastor and the author, Scott McKnight, says that in every form of suffering, we directly experience the gospel because the gospel is about suffering, giving way to death, and beyond death to the victory of resurrection. And God lovingly draws us into his experience in 
his experience in every experience of suffering. Paul famously, the, you know, who we talked about earlier, he went um, after his dramatic change, he wrote a letter um, and, and, and in, in Romans chapter 5, we read, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. You see, when suffering comes, and it will come, we have a choice. Suffering either leads us closer to Jesus or it leads us away from him. As someone shared with me uh, uh, just a picture they had this morning. They were on the, on the road here, um, on the M3, and there was a diversion. These diversions happen, don't they? And sometimes, the, and, and she just sensed that this was like the enemy putting obstacles in the way in our own lives. You know, different bits of suffering, different experiences that we have. The reality is if we turn away from Jesus, we will find ourselves in a worse place than before. But when we keep going, I'm not suggesting you go straight down the M3 if there's a diversion (laughs) elsewhere. Let's not take that analogy too far. But when we keep going, despite our struggles, our character is built up. And as our character is built, hope rises. And that is the hope that we can share with others. You know, because a biblical church is meant to scatter. The good news of Jesus' death, life, and resurrection is especially good news for those who don't yet know Jesus. And as we jump into chapter 8, we begin to see the impact of Stephen's death. Firstly, we see Saul at this point in time, he's actively chasing down Christians and killing them. But when his life changes, he does the opposite. He shares the good news that he has encountered with the Gentiles, with the known world. And then we read on in chapter 11 that after Stephen's killing, the church was scattered into all these different parts of the world. And we read in verse 21 that the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So what was a dark day for the church when they experienced the hope that they knew from the suffering that they'd gone through? The church grew rapidly. As the church left the comfort of Jerusalem, remarkable things started to happen. And it's meant to be the same for us. If we leave the comfort of our own homes and our church buildings, as we share the good news of Jesus with those around us, we can share that same hope. You see, the church can't reach those who need the good news if we simply stay in the building. You know, we gather on Sundays, we gather in small groups, in order that we would then scatter out into our homes, our workplaces, colleges, and schools to be and to bring the good news to those who need it. But like Paul and the other apostles, like Stephen, we can't do it in our own strength. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because, and this is where I want to end, a biblical church is spirit-filled. Stephen had earlier accused the religious leaders by saying, you always resist the Holy Spirit. But as Alex mentioned earlier, as Stephen was stoned to death, we read in verse 55 that he was full of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I want to be more like Stephen. I don't want to be someone who resists the Spirit. I want to be someone who lives full of the Holy Spirit. So if the church is to be biblical, we need to be spirit-filled. Otherwise, our words and our actions are just that. They're just words and actions. But when we, the church, are spirit-filled, when we carry that hope around with us, when we share that good news of Jesus with those around us, whoever we encounter, we will see things change. We will see the sick made well. We will see a church full of courage and integrity, reaching out to those in need, feeding the hungry, serving the sick. We see a church that is going to transform the world around us and the communities that we are part of. I want to see more of those things in my lifetime. But you and I can't do it on our own. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Shall we stand if we're able?